Greetings and welcome to a discussion on stepping up against racism and xenophobia, SPARK project. As Nelson Mandela once stated, no one is born hating another person because of the color of their skin. Yet racism and xenophobia perpetuates in individuals and systems. How are racism and xenophobia learned and how can they be unlearned in children and adolescents? How can we effectively disrupt the effects of racism and xenophobia on children and adolescents? Many schools and policymakers attempt to address racism and xenophobia, yet they often rely on anecdotal suggestions instead of scientifically informed best practices and intervention approaches. The Stepping Up Against Racism and Xenophobia project involves a coalition, a collaborate, a collaborative of scholars and community members who are committed to promoting anti-racist and anti-xenophobic competencies in children. Dr. Debbie Regis Drake, 2022 Research and Community Impact Fellow, will moderate a panel discussion follow, uh, focused on how to develop and maintain university partnerships that center on community members, voices, concerns, and priorities. Our panelists will share their experiences communicating and connecting anti-racist and anti-xenophobic research to practice with parents, caregivers, and educators. Hi, my name is Kenan Colquitt. I'm the program lead for diversity scholar engagement with the National Center for Institutional Diversity. I facilitate programs and initiatives such as the Diversity Scholars Network that are committed to advancing understandings of historical and contemporary social issues related to identity, difference, culture, representation, power, oppression, and inequality as they occur and affect individuals, groups, communities, and institutions. We are proud to sponsor this program in collaboration with NCIC, NCID's Anti-Racism Collaborative, the University of Michigan Strategic Space for Engagement Around Anti-Racism Research and Scholarship, and part of the Provost Anti-Racism Initiative. On behalf of myself, NCID's Anti-Racism Collaborative, we welcome you. We begin this presentation with a land acknowledgement. The University of Michigan is located on, on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Three Fires Confederacy made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially through the treaty, through the treaty at the foot of the rapids. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists, Dr. Andrew Grant Thomas. As founder and co-director of Embrace Race, Dr. Grant Thomas leads efforts to support parents, educators, and other caregivers to raise children who are thoughtful, informed, and brave about race in the United States. In stops that include Harvard's uh, Civil Rights Project, the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Racism, uh, Race and Ethnicity, the Protus Fund, and now Embrace Race, he, can, he champions efforts he believes can make meaningful differences for real people and communities, not 100 years from now, but in his lifetime and the lifetime of his two tween children. Andrew earned his PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. Dr. Gabriella Levis Stein. Dr. Stein is a licensed psychologist and professor of psychology at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Dr. Stein specializes in cultural resilience in communities of color, especially Latinx youth and their families. She also does research on mental health access and prevention programs for Latinx families. Clinically, she specializes in the provision of therapeutic services to Latinx families and provides training to providers working with Latinx communities. Dr. Lauren Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs is a postdoctoral research fellow with NCID's Anti-Racism Collaborative and Stepping Up Against Racism and Xenophobia Project. She grounds her work in the qualities of creativity, compassion, and connectedness and her research uh, pursues questions about how people learn about their identities 
how they choose to share their identities, and how they make their mark on the world. And now, our moderator for this event, Dr. Rivas Drake. Deborah Rivas, Rivas Drake is a Stephanie Rowley Collegiate Professor in Education and Professor of Psychology at the University of Michigan. The overarching goal of her work is to illuminate promises, promising practices that disrupt racism and xenophobia and help keep diverse young people with on trajectories of positive contribution to their schools and communities. In addition to more than 90 publications, reports, briefs, and award-winning co-authored book, Below the Surface, Talking with Teens About Race, Ethnicity, and Identity, she has lent her expertise more broadly by collaborating with school le uh, leaders and district policymakers to develop translational activities for educators, in writings and webinars for parents and educators, and by consulting on race and ethnicity issues in youth for nonprofit organizations, youth program developers, and industry. So thank you all for being here. Dr. Rivas Drake, thank you for moderating this event. Thank you so much, Keenan, uh, for the wonderful um, introductions. I'm so excited uh, to have this panel uh, with us and to start a conversation um, about how researchers, caregivers, educators, and community members, including youth workers and others, you know, how we can all work together to support anti-racist competencies in children. And if I'm being honest, also in ourselves, right? Um, to start us off, I want to tell you a little bit about what else I'm bringing to the conversation today. So you heard my professional bio, but I think it's important that we ground our conversation a little bit in, you know, who else we are and what we're also what we're bringing. And so first and foremost, I think it's important to say that I'm a parent. So I'm a mom. I have two 11 year olds and I'm definitely bringing that experience and that set of lived experiences to this conversation. I have a personal commitment to raising anti racist children. And I see this as um, something like you literally are working on every single day and that I work on every single day. So um, that's part of why I do this work. And I also think that it's important to note that I didn't, you know, I think for me, I didn't grow up with language around anti-racism or even racism um, in a systemic sense. So um, what I came to learn of as systemic racism really kind of unfolded over my life, uh, over many different experiences that I've had. Um, when I was growing up as a Latina with a blue collar background and my parents are immigrants, I was essentially socialized to fully internalize this like idea that, you know, you know, hard work and determination would pay off. And the notion that there was unequal access to resources or power just wasn't part of my, you know, how my understanding as I was growing up. So I'm trying to work on that with my own kids. Um, and then I'm also, of course, a researcher. So my research is asset based, which means that, you know, I really look at strengths and, you know, what youth are bringing to their different, uh, you know, everyday contexts. And that, and I believe that teaching youth about racism and fostering and supporting healthy and robust identities is really important. And we know from the literature it's borne out in many studies that it's really um, so important for supporting their emotional, academic, and physical well being. So the Sparks Project really is motivated by all of that and really brings together, you know, a lot of different strands, you know, of the, what I just shared. But I should note that I direct the Sparks Project, so that's motivating, you know, this project. However, um, our major goal is to really figure out how can we meet parents, educators, and other right um, community members where they are um, to help them, right, develop support the development of these competencies in um, young people. And I'm very honored to share the stage today with uh, some of the partners in that work, including Gabby, who's a member of our research steering committee, and Andrew, who is a member of our community advisory board. And of course, Laura Ann, who is a wonderful, amazing postdoctoral fellow through the um, generous support of NCID, who brings years of experience as a classroom educator. And so together, you know, we are working um, to realize the goals of Sparks. So I've told you a little bit about what I'm bringing. And my first question for the panel for you all is to invite you to share a little bit uh, uh, more about what you're bringing to this conversation um, today. And for this question, I want to start with Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. So 
Uh, and you mean besides the goofy profile picture that some of you saw, right? So I'm definitely bringing that. But in addition to that goofy profile picture, uh, gratitude uh, for real to you, Debbie, for the invitation and really for the work that you just described, right? And the work of the Sparks Project, you know, Laura Ann and Gabby, um, you know, one of the best, really one of the best things about doing this work, not only embrace race, but all the sort of racial justice, racial equity work that I've done is the ability to the proximity, right? To people like you, and other, right, just really smart, passionate people who are doing really good work. There's obviously a lot to be dismayed about <laughs> in this country, in this world, in our institutions. It's incredibly encouraging and buoying to meet people who share, right, uh, certainly my convictions. Um, and shout out to my Embrace Race team. I know they're watching and they are certainly high among that group of people for, for, for whom I'm really grateful. Uh, and also to Keenan and the rest of the event production team whose you know, really careful attention to the preparation for this is so appreciated. Um, I'm too a parent, 12 and 14 year old brown skinned children. Uh, that's a huge part certainly of what motivates uh, my work and our work. Um, Melissa Giroux, my life partner and I started Embrace Race in 2016, so we're now in our seventh year. And, you know, uh, Keenan mentioned uh, that in, in my bio, but the point of that work is really to support the adults and, adults and the lives of children to do this anti-racist uh, sort of nurturing that we'll be talking about today. So certainly I bring that perspective uh, as a leader in that work for my organization. Um, you know, racial justice worker. You know, my entire career has been devoted to you know, how do we promote, how do we further bend the moral arc of the universe toward justice, especially using race as a point of departure. Uh, that's in education and housing and criminal justice and health and really uh, sort of all the big domains we tend to think of. And I very much see this conversation today and the work of right, children's racial learning as squarely in that space um, and an unattended to or insufficiently attended to area within that space. And finally, you know, uh, there's this great quote from a journalist, Max Lerner. He says, I am neither an optimist nor a pessimist. I'm a possibilist. I love that quote, right? Again, we're living in times when it's hard to be optimistic about, you know, how much we can achieve in the short term. But is it possible that collectively we can make a meaningful difference in the lives of our children, in our own lives, uh, in, in the sort of trajectory of this multiracial democracy? Absolutely, it is more than possible. And that turns out to be enough, right, to get out of bed and go excitedly around about your day trying to do this work. So I'm bringing all of that and grateful to be here. Thank you. Uh, Gabby, can we turn to you? So I am also grateful to be here. And I um, also like Debbie Bring, I, I'm a Latina immigrant. I immigrated when I was four years old, but had a different story. My uh, great grandfather, Pablo Olivas, uh, wrote one of the first books for teacher education in Mexico. And he himself had pursued a higher education. And so education has been something very central to our family. Um, my dad also, um, had a PhD in economics. So yeah, um, so that was something that we sort of had in terms of I was privileged to have that as, as, a, as a child. And he also, um, because of the education he had attained, had the deeper understanding of racial equity and justice that he instilled in me young. He often um, talked about how important it was to him. We rooted for the Dodgers as a family because of Jackie Robinson and how as a brown boy in Mexico, that was so inspirational to him. So I am here in honor of, of that legacy that I had with my father growing up. So we definitely had some of these conversations, but not as much as I needed. And I'm still growing in this space. And I'm very grateful for all the people who helped me grow in this space. 
Um, in 2016, uh, we started our One Talk at a Time project, um, which was also committed to fostering conversations about race and ethnicity with diverse families. Um, and I'm really grateful to do that work in partnership with Dr. Lisa Kyung at Wake Forest, Dr. Stephanie Irby Cord here at UNCG, and Dr. Laura Gonzalez here at UNCG as well. And I've learned so much from them. And as we've partnered together and working in terms of how do we develop these competencies, not only in kids, but also in parents to sort of have these, these challenging conversations. I, I bring that to the table as well. And just how I'm continually um, also, as Andrew was mentioning, very open to and here and, and it's so excited that I get to partner with so many folks in this space. And I'm also a parent um, as well. I have two uh, a 11 and and 14 year old uh, child, um, I'm married to a, a, a white man and his, and our child children are white. So I also bring that to the space. How, how do I help my white children um, really understand um, how to be anti-racist? Um, so personally, that's another thing in, in our multiracial family, how do they integrate that with their Latinx identity? Um, so that's something else I bring to the table. So I'm just really honored to be here and excited for this conversation. Thank you, Gabby and Laura Ann. Hi, thank you. I'm um, also filled with thankfulness and gratitude to be participating today and have already in my time on the project learned um, so much from Debbie and Gabby and Andrew. And um, I'm very, very honored to have my my box on the grid with yours. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, in terms of you know, our positionality, who are we? I am a Korean American adoptee and I have a friend, a mentor, like someone who I, I feel sisterly towards, Joy Lieberthal Rowe, who talks about the importance of um, owning or becoming those each of those three words individually and also together. Um, so that means I'm an inter-country adoptee. I was born in Korea and I was raised in the American South in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'm also a transracial adoptee. So my parents are white and my extended family is all white. So I grew up in an all white family in the American South. That was um, pretty influential, I would say, as a thing that I bring. Um, and I was socialized really strongly to believe that um, love and family transcends race, um, that invisibilizing racial difference is the solution to um, us experiencing harm and hurt. And I think that actually has been a very harmful narrative for me in my life. Um, and that's, that's some of where I come from. Also from a background of, um, living a life as an adult that is different from how I've been socialized as a child. So the belief also that people can choose to be anti-racist and we can act and learn to be anti-racist every day is something that I bring. Um, so as an adult, um, I am connected with a larger Korean American adoptee community, um, which is a space that embraces our wholeness. It also works towards radical healing for us as individuals and for us as part of a larger diaspora. Um, a current role that I have within that community beyond my postdoc is I do help run two uh, Korean culture summer camps that support Korean American youth and fostering a sense of their Korean American cultural identity. It's a really important thing that I love and do. Um, and that comes from my background as a former high school English teacher. So I taught public high school in Spartanburg, South Carolina uh, for six years before starting my doctoral program at Michigan. Um, and as a postdoc and as a researcher, um, I specialize in anti-racism and anti-racist teacher education which means that I work with pre-service teachers or student teachers might be a, more, a word people are more familiar with and thinking about how to be anti-racist and how they design their curriculum or what they teach in their instruction, which is how they teach it and their personal work of their classroom, which is how they create community or how they build relationships with students. Um, and that transfers to my work on Sparks Project, which I also wanna thank. We have a very large team of people on the Sparks Project also who are not who don't have their little boxes on the grid today, um, but we have a large group of undergraduate, masters, and doctoral students who are really um, who are contributing so much of themselves and um, their thoughtfulness and rigor also to this project. So I want to thank. I think there may be some in our audience today. So I want to thank you and shout out to you. Thank you. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, so grateful for them. So uh, I want to thank you all for sharing a bit about that. that's not something we typically do. We hear the bios and then we don't talk about this part, but of course it's really important. Um, and I wanted to do a little bit of that in part because some of our members of our audience may be parents, maybe educators, you know, we don't, I'm not really, um, obviously, you know, would know exactly what's bringing folks to the table. 
Um, but they might, like all of us, have been exposed to all the different information out there about how to talk with young people about race, racism, and immigration issues. And especially in the last couple of years, I feel like there's been a, just a real um, explosion of this information. And so, you know, um, thinking about where we're coming from in, in these, you know, in these, um, you know, interactions with young people, um, I really, I, I know that there is such a range, right? You have folks who are just having sort of like an end, you know, kind of just starting to have the conversations and looking for guidance there. And then folks who are maybe more comfortable with some of the basics, but not really sure how to, you know, take it to that next level or really broach more what, what we would consider advanced issues. Um, we're learning that through the Sparks Project. Um, we have uh, interviewed 62 parents from all over the country in lots of different places, a section of experiences, you know, really beautiful, um, learning experience as part of our needs assessment uh, phase for the for the project. But we're really seeing that range, you know, all the way from, you know, sort of wanting to enter into the space to really being much further along. And so I want to maybe start our discussion with this question of, you know, how can we best support those adults, right, in youth's lives to help their youth Right, develop these uh, orientations and these understandings and these competencies. What would you advise them? And I'm gonna maybe ask Laura Ann to start with this one. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for asking. Um, yeah. So, how are we supporting adults to support youth? Um, so, I have uh, helped to conduct a lot of those 62 interviews, and also have worked on analyzing them. So, I might be talking a little bit. A lot about a lot of it about the project itself and the data that we've collected, but um, there are a few things that have been on my mind as I've been looking through those. Um, and I, I maybe I'll use some examples. But one of the things is, um, I think that the most important thing that I would tell parents or any adult who's doing anti-racist work with children or on their own is that it's going to be uncomfortable. I think that people should know that, um, and it requires a lot of critical self-reflection, which can be difficult and challenging, and it requires a lot of work, um, that if you're choosing to learn more about anti-racism, you are choosing to do. Um, and so I think that, you know, recognizing that about yourself is a big, is a big thing. Um, in one of the interviews, um, I was looking at um, a Native American mother of two biracial children who are Native American and Black, and she was talking about her um, her son, her teenage son, who had been pulled over by the police. And she, in the interview, she's very emotional, saying, um, I never would think to respond to a police officer the way my son responded. And it brings me to tears to think about that conversation. And, like, I have to get beyond the point of tears, and I need to have those conversations with my son. But my experience is so different from his that I have to understand what it's like to you know, to live in, you know, from his perspective and hear him and understand. So I think she was really uncomfortable with that as an adult, as an adult, understanding that people experience the world in ways that are different from her. But she also had a perspective where she wanted to do that. Um, and I think also, you know, kind of in a similar related to that would be, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of parents in these interviews who I would want them to, to take an asset based approach towards themselves. And to look at the things that they are already doing. So that mother who's saying, I've never thought about this. She is thinking about it now. It is a next step for her. And she is making a movement towards change. Um, but I've interviewed, I had an interesting interview with a mother who, uh, her family's Tongan. And she grew up in Hawaii. And I asked her, you know, how do you talk to your kids about race and racism, immigration, xenophobia? And she said, I don't really look up stuff like that. I don't really talk about that kind of stuff with my kids. But she grew up in Hawaii and she was really um, following um, protests at Mauna Kea with the building of the telescope on sacred Hawaiian land. And so she's saying that she's watching Instagram live videos because a local perspective, Hawaiian perspective is important for that, more important than these outlets. You know, with what is really a critical perspective of colonialism, of white supremacy, of racism, and um, also at the same time saying that she doesn't she doesn't learn about these topics because she doesn't have formal education in them. And so that would be another thing, would be that people are, are likely already engaging in different ways. They're just not what we would call, as academics call, 
like like a, a learning. So there's a big self education piece as well. Mm -hmm. So what can parents do? I think that it would be to recognize that you are uncomfortable, and then also to um, you know persist through that discomfort, and then also to recognize the things that you are already doing and the steps that you're moving towards change, whether they're small things like you know checking your TikTok or whatever it is you're doing. And, you know, that is something. There is a lot of activism that happens on social media. And so I think that's an important thing to recognize. I have more things that I probably could say or address, but I'll, I'll leave space also for Andrew and Gabby. Um, whoever wants to take the next or go next, feel free. Gabby, please. Okay, this is always that awkward, like who's gonna go next? <laughs> um, I'm just gonna build off on what Laura Ann said because the work that we've done, we found some very similar kinds of things. And one thing I think that parents often talk about is that they have to be ready, um, right? And in fact, in our intervention, we say ready, set, talk, but they think that they have to know everything and know all the answers and have all the information and then start having these conversations with their kids. And one piece of advice is that we're this is a continually learning process, right? I'm still learning, we're all still learning, you're all still learning. So having that grace for yourself that you're never going to be fully ready and that you just have to go for it um, and you just have to start having these conversations with with your kids and having them together. So our second piece of advice that we have is follow your kids leads. Your kids are learning a lot about these. They're having these conversations. They're thinking about these things. I still remember. Um, when Mateo asked me at four years old, my son said, why, well, sorry, you all don't know who Mateo is. He asked me, what, why are all the superheroes that we've seen uh, white? Like, he just was like, what, what's going on? Like, he just like sort of noticed that and wanted to have this conversation. And so I think a lot of times it's sort of follow their leads and, and have those conversations with them. Some of the research that one of my graduate students, Pooja Patel is doing is finding particularly with immigrant families kids are helping parents learn these processes. Kids are directing these conversations. So we should be open to hearing them and hearing their ideas. Kids know so much. So let's have a dialogue with them. So this is something where you can grow together as a family. This isn't something that you have to teach your child. This is something that you're on a journey together and you can move together through that. Um, so I think that's another piece. Don't expect to be perfect. You're not, you're gonna make mistakes. You might say something that then you let her leave later realize like, oh, that maybe wasn't the right way to approach this. And that's okay. Again, have that grace to your, for yourself and, and come back and have those conversations. One of the reasons we named our intervention One Talk at a Time is because it's that. It's not just one talk, right? It's you continue to have these dialogues over time. And as kids get older, they'll get deeper and, and different and, and um, more nuanced. And then the last piece I'll say is that you know different communities start these conversations in different places, um, and particularly for immigrant communities that have it that have sort of as Debbie was mentioning earlier, sort of this belief of the American dream and we're coming here and it's going to be okay. How much harder it is for them to then say, I've chosen to come to a place potentially where I might experience xenophobia, where I might experience racism. So th those don't align, right? So it's really hard for, for families to really think around, I've chosen to come here and yet I'm putting me and my family in harm's way in some ways. Um, so really, really thinking around that we all are starting this journey in different places and what are the different influences that have us. So in that self-reflection that Laura Ann was talking about, that critical self-reflection, really thinking about those, like your own kind of, um, beliefs around, especially uh, meritocracy and and sort of achievement. Like I think those are places where a lot of this sneaks in that we don't realize is highly racialized as well. Um, so that's where I'm going to stop. I have a lot more I can also say, but I'm going to pass it over to Andrew. Yeah, that's really good stuff. You know, it's um, you know, it's so common on on panels uh, like this to hear, you know, you know, a couple of panelists speak, and then the third panelist says, "Oh, I agree with everything they said." I really do agree with everything you have said. I mean, that's really strong, important stuff, and, and hopefully we can all attend to it. Um, I'll add a couple of thoughts. One is about, you know, being clear on the stakes, as, as clear as we can on the stakes of what's involved here. So mm -hmm. it's really tempting, right, for a parent, and certainly most parents come to embrace race, I think, with the idea of, essentially, I want to produce a good human being, right? I want to help nurture a good person, a good individual. And that obviously is a fabulous motive um, on which to act. And it's more than that, right? There's more at stake than that. Um, as I suggested, I think in my opening remarks, who we are collectively uh, will be shaped in significant part by who we are individually, right? This is not only about 
you know, nurturing wonderful individuals. It's about nurturing really good community members. And the community we have today, you know, roughly two in five of the 300 million plus of us do not identify simply as non-Hispanic white, right? And that share is growing. If we don't figure out right, how to do better, how to be together better, how we perceive each other, you know, there are a whole number of um, really significant social issue areas and social problems, right? In education and, and employment and, you know, health policy and the social uh, network that we provide for ourselves and each other, mass incarceration, I mean, any number of huge issues where race, not saying race is the only thing, it's never the only thing, but it is a central thing. And perceptions of the other is a central uh, piece of how we perceive these issues and what kind of solutions we, we think to implement. So, you know, this work that we do, uh, the, the, the big picture implication of it is huge, right? So we do this work not only because of the children and the human beings, again, we nurture, but again, the community members they are and will become. Um, and hopefully that becomes even more motivating then, right, to do this work. A second thing I want to point out, and uh, you, know, you both, both Gabby and Laura, and underlined this already, but the self-work, the self-work. So many people, you know, we're not uh, dragging anyone kicking and screaming to embrace race, right? It's a self-selected group. They come to us and, you know, they come to us because presumably they believe that this sort of issue of anti-racism, color braveness, um, is really important. And, and we have been surprised at times by how many people seem to think that it's just about, you know, let me get a book list, right? Uh, give me some recommendations for TV shows. Not appreciating that actually to do, to model, right? As in as healthy a way as possible to do this guiding work as an adult, you need to do your own work, right? Critical self-reflection, uh, as Gabby said, and again, Laura Ann made the same point. It is, it's a real investment um, that you need to make, right? Uh, it's, it won't come cheaply. Uh, so that's a thing to emphasize. And I'll mention one last thing. Um, find community in doing this work, right? So at a time we know that race itself, even you know, any talk of race is so politicized, uh, understood by so many to be a partisan issue, there are lots and lots of people who absolutely do not have community where they are, right? Their, their partners, if they have them, may not be on the same page with them about the need for this work, the importance of this work, much less how to do it, their friends, neighbors, families, but even those of us who live in places where we do have that kind of immediate and proximate support, need, we are social creatures, right? It's not only about sharing experiences and you know resources and, and you know advice and all of that. If we can find community and social contexts that nurture us, uh, that um, you know, in which we 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 are comfortable and happy to be we're ha with these exchanges we have with others. This work, uh, which needs to be done over time, routinely, will be a much much easier to do. Think of it as your you know the equivalent of your gym buddy, uh, if if you have such a thing. So find a community. I think is a big one as well. Thank you so much. You know, um, I had another question I was going to turn to, but your comments are all making me um think of a, a a different question and kind of uh to pull a little bit of the thread that i heard in all of your responses which is about that self-education critical reflection self-reflection piece to it um one of the things that we and i'll just take the moderator's privilege to add a little bit more <laughs> my own thoughts here i hope that's okay um that we have been hearing in these interviews with parents and educators um, is a desire, um, Gabby, kind of echoing a little bit of what you're saying, what you were saying before, um, for ways to learn together with their kids. They don't necessarily see this as a, I'm working on myself in order to then be prepared for, for these conversations or to um, broach some of these um, challenging issues or even um, engage in positive, you know, supporting, right? um types of activities with their kids but really things that what can we do together they really see some a lot of parents really see this as like a family project um 
And the other thing that I was thinking of, and it's kind of a, a question for for all of you in terms of that self education piece is, you know, we've heard a lot that um, folks are also are really um, hungry for community for um, learning from other people's stories from learning with other people, not just their children, but also other um, folk, you know, other parents, other um, educators who are in the same kind of um, have the same dispositions who really want to do this work and not feel isolated. And it's, I was just curious to know if in your areas of work and the different spaces in which you've conducted this work, you know, um, you have seen, um, you know, good resources, if there are some in development, if there are ways that you have helped foster these connections um, to others, either among educators or among parents. Um, so that they are kind of engaging in this work again, right, in, in community with others, if there are, you know, ideas that you have about how that can happen or if you do it in your own work. I think I, I might ask Gabby because I think I know that you're doing this for sure. And yeah. I know Andrew is as well. So um, if you allow me that leading question, you know, I think it would be great for our audience to hear a little bit more about those efforts. No, I definitely, so unfortunately, our, we had a, the original test of our intervention, we were thinking about really looking at with others on, on your own and how did parents like do better. And unfortunately, our reviewers were not too keen on, like, you're doing too much at once, which is one of the tips I had is you can only start one way from a research perspective. But what we did hear from our participants was that exactly that, that you're saying, uh, that they, particularly for some of the immigrant families in which they had really just a lot of hesitation. They don't really know how to engage in these conversations. They didn't have these types of conversations before. And they don't even understand race potentially from the way that it's been American. Like they might understand race in their own context, but not necessarily in the American way. So that they really were yearning for some of those kind of spaces to do this work together in community. I will say that some of the other work that I've that I've done um, in terms of just some community outreach and, and mental health work that I've done, this definitely comes up from the families. Um, so we're just doing a, a work, some work um, with a, a group of women um, here in North Carolina, and they were asking, they're like, you know, they were asking about LGBTQ and how to like, and different identities. And they're like, I don't understand what's like, my kid is coming home and their kid is, um, their friend used to be a, a girl and now, they identify as non-binary. What even is that, right? And so they were like trying to have this collective learning. And when we think about it from just a systemic kind of perspective, right? Sort of this wanting that information and really being open and asking questions and having space where they can ask questions and feel comfortable doing that. And then we were promoting having those conversations with your kids. And so how do you have these conversations with your kids about different populations that might be marginalized and their different types of experiences? So I definitely think that that's something communities are seeking. Um, and I, I I think what's what's challenging to do, I think that communities that have already put, have been put together with that kind of goal of helping and supporting each other, I think is a place to start. But I think that we can do a lot more. This is, I think, a place where we're really excited to grow into terms of how do you connect people, whether virtually, whether through some like a, you know, through some sort of um, Zoom or connection or um, th things of that, like that could work. Because I think some of the things that have worked for white groups like white anti-racist reading groups may look a little bit different in different communities. Thank you. Yeah, I can offer some thoughts there. I mean, it's, um, you know, first I should say, gosh, there are lots of things I should say. One thing I should say is that, you know, community building, you know, we think of community building as one of our st three strategic pillars, mm -hmm. right? So resource building, community building, field building. Uh, which is to say that yeah, community building is huge for us and we have a lot to learn about how to do it well in ways that really serve uh, our community members. Part of what we need to do more thinking about is you know, really more careful nuanced thinking about what we mean by community, right? And the benefits it can deliver and you know what it entails, the forms it can take, yeah, how, as Gabby suggests, it, you know, the form it takes needs to shift according to the needs um, and, you know, capacities of the population involved. I mean, so there's actually some high level challenges, but there are some, uh, certainly we have some specific communities in place. And I want to mention one in particular, which sort of has a community within it. So we have 
an early childhood community called the Color Brief Community, right? So it's online, say it's virtual. It is for caregivers broadly conceived, right? So parents, family members, educators, others, um, to young children of color, right? Eight and younger, more or less. And within that community, we have uh, communities of learning and practice, essentially affinity groups, whether by role, by race, by combination, and hopefully as a community grows, we'll be able to offer more combinations that really fit what people are looking for. One thing that's you know both interesting and sort of instructive about these affinity groups, and we're now we just finished I think our fourth cycle. Um, you know we have these amazing uh, facilitators, three facilitators that sort of facilitate the Color Brave community as a whole, and also facilitate uh, sometimes with others the uh, affinity groups is you know when people sign up when people register for these um, affinity groups we ask them why they're doing it and what we've noted is it really doesn't matter what the topic is right so we have specific topics around which we organize each affinity group but in fact for the most part people want to be with other people who are who they believe must be sharing their same right sharing their concerns sharing you know, important pieces of their positionality. That's what people really want, right? And yes, given that we're talking about how do we nurture you know, color brave kids, young children of color, we can talk about anything and I'm there, right? So that's really something that kind of, you know, is why I mentioned sort of the social piece, right? It's sort of the, the, the you know, fellowship piece of it quite apart from the particulars. Um, and the very last thing I'll say, Debbie, is, you know, we started when Melissa and I started in 2016, we really were thinking to lead with the resource building piece. And we did. We knew that there needed to be some community work, but we have sort of elevated or our community has said, you need to elevate this community building piece because the resources are simply not enough. Right. We need this. So in a way, that's why uh, we're sort of lagging in, in uh, doing the best we can to develop that community building piece, but it is enormous and our community has made that clear. Thank you so much. Lauren, is there something? Yeah. Else? Okay. Well, I wanna take um, Andrew's answer as the last speaker and say, yes, I agree. I agree with all the other panelists. <laughs> While y'all were speaking, I was thinking, yeah, that's awesome. What could I add? Um, so thank you also for those. Um, I loved, Andrew, your, your words about like what forms can community take? Um, I think that's really important. I think, you know, uh, I have before had a more narrow view of what community could take, which was bounded by geography. And, you know, even us today, you know, being virtual community, uh, can be geographically disparate and still be, be a community. I think that's a very interesting thing. Uh, but in thinking about constraints and capacity and what community building could look like in terms of the Sparks project, um, you know, something that a lot of parents have mentioned and Debbie, thinking back to your question about parents who've expressed learning from others' stories, a lot of parents have expressed that they're very interested in doing more. They just have maybe 10 to 15 minutes while they like shovel breakfast in their mouth before <laughs> they like take everybody, you know, to school in the morning or or something like that. And like, how is it that I can have um, have community or learn from others? And people want to hear um, kind of to, to echo what Andrew and Gabby have said, people whose stories are similar or related to them. And a lot of people, there was a there have been both parents and educators who have said, I wanna hear the story of someone who has like done it right or someone who's been successful. Can you give me an example of not someone who's trying it, but someone who's done it? What did they say? How did they do it? Can I mimic that in some way? It could be role playing, but it could just be, it could be a scenario, it could be a script, but it could just be like, I just wanna know that it's possible that there's someone out there who's doing it, who's done it. So. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's a little bit more abstract than an action-based thing that Gabby or Andrew have mentioned, but in just thinking about the project, I think um, where we are, it's um, a, 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 an opportunity to imagine what cre you know creating opportunities for community could look like um, with project, yeah. Can I 
Can I just add to that real quick? Because that think um, no, that's exactly that's so interesting. I hadn't thought about that because we developed our videos based on that exact thing that people had said that we want to watch families have these conversations because somehow, again, it's that sense of self-efficacy. Because I think that's one of the things that we really focus on is building that sense of self-efficacy. And people don't feel, I mean, we don't feel efficacious as parents for lots of things, right? And they have, that's why we have so many baby books out there, right? We we need to build the sense of efficacy as parents. Um, so that um so I think that that's a piece that people like role modeling, we know works, right? So just seeing that and having that. So in some ways we create this um, in the videos that we made for one talk at a time. So people can see that like, this is something I can do as well. And these conversations don't have to look at, you know, I don't know what people think in their heads that these look like, uh, Laura Ann. I, I think that's such an interesting point, but that they're just conversations and that they happen and, and that they're just like any other conversation you might have with your kid. Um, you know, or or in a school setting that might that might be uncomfortable and might be sort of you need to have that patience. So I love that notion of thinking around how do you build community, even just seeing others like you that are in that same position, even if you don't have any contact with them. Yeah, I don't know if any of your videos are set in a car, but my and or if your kids <laughs> like mine, a lot of the conversations when they were younger were always when we were on our way to the grocery stores, on our way somewhere, you know, just questions coming from the back. <laughs> and so, you know, it's not always like, okay, now we're gonna sit down and have the conversation. It's 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 every day, it's all the things that we do that they're picking up on, where you and live, that, where you go to school, all of those things. And, and I wanna look at throwing just a little piece along these lines, because I think it's such an important point. I think, you know, the idea of community building can be so daunting because, and you know, Laura and I'm so there with you. And you know, we had a really, I certainly had a really a, a quite narrow idea of what building a committee would mean, right? And so, right, I think our minds tend to go to this really robust, right? Really sort of thick web of relationships. But in end, that obviously can be wonderful. And I think about our webinars, right? After uh, George Floyd's murder, a lot of people started coming to our webinars and our numbers grew. And we'd have thousands of people registering, right? And you could have 3,000 people on at a time. And when that happens, you know, the chat starts hopping, right? So people are back and forth and there's just a stream of comments and people are exchanging resources and even arranging to connect. Oh, you're in Portland, I'm in Portland. And it's wonderful. And it's this parallel world. It is a community. And from the comments we got, we also realized that there were a lot of people who are looking at that and they're feeling, you know, they're not asking questions, they're not putting anything into the chat, but they feel like, oh my gosh, there's these people who share my concerns, right? And again, at this moment of, again, extreme ideological polarization on any number of dimensions, racial, all of this stuff, it turns out that it's hugely valuable to a lot of people simply to connect, right? To be aware that there are other people who share their concerns, who share their wishes, for their children and it's a way of declaring themselves right just showing up to the webinars like i'm on this side of things there's real value in that and it's and it's certainly um hard, uh, much easier to erect that kind of or build a scaffolding for that kind of community than maybe where our minds tend to go yes i agree thank you so much um and sort of took us a little bit off course, but uh, I thought really fruitfully. So you blame uh, you, Debbie. maybe get us back to a question that, um, you know, sort of has to do with the nature of uh, the Sparks sort of design is to involve community, to think about community writ large, um, but also a different forms of community, right? Sort of factor into our design, but also it's research oriented, right? So we are a research, research action project where the, the purpose of the research is to really think through some of these issues that we've been discussing and how best to um, serve, again, parents and educators um, in the products that we'll be developing. And so one of the things that I'm wondering, um, since all of you have, you know, engaged with or are researchers or, you know, very, very familiar with research um, sort of communities, you know, for lack of a better word, um, how would you advise, you know, researchers, right, we may have a lot of researchers in our audience, actually, so um, who want to do this kind of work with, you know, a community orientation with community facing entities, you know, to go about doing that, um, you know, sort of 
either as a collaboration or just in partnership, how, how would you advise them to, to approach that work? And for this one, I'm gonna start with Gabby. So, you know, you're gonna think this was planned, but critical self-reflection would be the first place to start. Um, no, but I, in, in all honesty, that is a place to start. Sort of what is motivating you to do this work? What are your lived experiences? Sort of the, the process that we went through at the beginning of this webinar, what are you bringing into this space? And what's your research expertise, um, right? How do you need to build on that? How do you need to complement that? Um, we were very purposeful in when we built together our One Talk at a Time team to have folks on our research team that had lived experiences with the different groups that we were hoping to partner with and also had that research expertise as well. So really thinking through what kind of ways to build a, a team um, and, and, and think around how do you do that? And how do you do that in partnership with, with community? Like you said, Debbie, right? So listening to the community, you know, talking to folks, um, we really developed our One Talk at a Time protocol because the community was asking for support in having these hard, these hard conversations. And we were trying to figure out a way to do that. So one tip I give is sort of start that critical self reflection, be really purposeful and intentional in building your research team, but also that should be inclusive of the community and to making sure that you're asking questions that are relevant to them and that are helpful to them and coming with solutions that are going to be useful. Um, as a community engaged scholar, you know, it is, you know, the work that I do is it, you know, it's going well when community organizations are saying, hey, we want to partner with you. That's what you want to build that excitement. And it's because we honor our community partners by listening to them in terms of what they're looking for and how do we leverage the research enterprise to support them, right? To, to, to give them data that they might use, to answer questions that they want, to fill needs that they have to fill. So, I, I, you know, that self reflection, that collaborative kind of spirit. And then this takes time. This is takes time to build trust with community. This isn't something that you can just go in and say, hey, I'm ready. I'm going to teach you how to be anti-racist. Or be like, okay, thank you. No, thank you. Um, so really thinking around building that community is going to take uh, some time of, of trust and of understanding with one another. Like, you know, I the one talk at a time, we, this is, we've been doing this in 2016. Um, and we're barely just launching the project um, in all, in you know, in a more sort of broad way. So just be patient as well. Um, I know that this is a, a, a I, I love the possibility that Andrew was talking about that that we that also wakes me up every morning that the, that the, we can do this but you also have to be patient um and so I think that you have to have, have both and right like we're in a hurry to do something so important and critical but we need to take our time to to do it right agreed uh Laura Ann thank you sorry there's a barking dog so I muted myself and then I didn't know when to unmute because it would look like I was interrupting Gabby. So here I am. Um, <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, yeah, so recommendations for researchers for how to engage community members. Um, I think, you know, Gabby's, you know, comments about critical self-action are really important. A really something that I always wonder about when thinking about a collaboration or a partnership um, with the critical self reflection is like why why this partner why this group and what about the things that are our shared goals do we want from like how would we work together how would we benefit each other how would we contribute um thinking about like other spaces that i have been in as well is thinking about how to you know, as we think about entering and exit spaces as researchers um thinking about how to do it with both a Maybe a balance or a harmony of confidence and humility. So to acknowledge also, you know, I'm a postdoc, so I'm a recent graduate, you know, acknowledging that I have some specialized expertise, right? And also knowing that there are ways that I don't. There are things that I'm not the most expert or most knowledgeable in. Um, even with conducting, we interviewed 26 educators as a part of the Sparks project. I taught high school English in South Carolina for six years, which for a doctoral student was seen as many years of experience. And for people who are classroom teachers, that is not a lot of years of experience actually, right? Um, and as I'm interviewing these educators, I'm talking to people who have taught for 12 years, 18 years, 25 years. They've taught social studies and English. They have taught from sixth grade to 12th grade. They have taught a in a three, four or five different states, right? Like the experience that I brought, even though I was bringing that to the table also, like you know, to have the humility to recognize that they have a special expert knowledge that I do not have, 
right? Um, that is really amazing to me also. So entering entering spaces that also position you as a learner, wondering what it is that you can learn from others. Also, while not discrediting like the, the things that you bring yourself, I think that's that's a thing that I'm still working on um, and trying trying to do. Um, you know, and thinking about the, what was I talking about? Goals, the building of goals is, um, you know, I really try to um, engage in ways that are responsive, I think is is a way that I try to like move in the world. And I think that I prioritize in um, the teacher education work that I do. Um, but something that is really interesting to me about the Sparks project is that it, you know, we're working to build a website and that work started, Gabby's talking about time, um, started with 88 interviews right Other than us building a website where we say here it is here is what expert university you know scholars say we actually want to know what people want and you know your previous question debbie about um learning that parents want scenarios or want to learn from other people like and that's something that we had not predicted or anticipated before we did those interviews that came out over and over and over again that people wanted that we now have a responsibility to respond to. Um, and so as researchers is thinking also about how to create um, create spaces to listen, I think that that is, um, maybe we could, I'm, I'm babbling now and I'm aware that I could do better about that in this moment. Um, but yeah, but how, how we could do, how we could do better to listen and to create space um you know in partnership um yeah those are just the things that are on my on my mind for now yeah thank you andrew yeah those were great you know um yeah now now y'all have jumbled me up because there's, there's, there's so much to to respond to let me say i think you know implicit in what laura Ann and i think and what gabby just said about critical self-reflection and 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 really what expertise looks like right, is this, I think we need to acknowledge that um, I think there are far more researchers who would agree with everything that's been said than actually subscribe to it in what they do, <laughs> right? So, and to be sure, it's not easy, right? So collaborative work with community is not easier. It's easier to go it alone, as it were, you know, which is sort of the more traditional researcher model. Um, so, uh, you know, insofar as there's a divergence between what researchers profess to believe and what they actually do, it's not only about not actually having the courage of their convictions, but it's the thing to ask, right? Do I really actually respect, right, the experiences, the particularities of community, the strengths and needs of community? Do I believe, right, can I, is my mindset such that they really could be co-equal partners in this work? Because, you know, it's a really good bet, um, certainly not all graduate programs are the same, but it's a good bet that you've gone through a graduate program and certainly gotten, a, you know, if you've gotten a PhD, you've been, you know, socialized into believing that some kinds of expertise uh, are more valuable than others, and that, in fact, only some kinds of knowledge constitutes expertise in the first place, right? So it's not necessarily an easy thing to really believe that, you know, you could or should be equal partners with, you know, community. Um, to the extent that you do respect, you know, experience, knowledge, strengths, needs, and particularities of community, then I think the question to ask is, is that respect reflected not only in what you say, but structured into the way you do your work, right, into the accountability mechanisms of your work? Um, you know, we have a program called the Rapid Response, Response Research Network, which is essentially a, uh, we call it a network, it's really a database of people who, you know, from our community, we have 65,000 people on our, um, in our, on our email list, Embrace Race email list, and then we'll be reaching out to lots of other organizations for partnership in this, and the question is, will, can we get family members, right, parents and children, to raise their hand and say, you know what, I am interested in supporting anti-racist research. So I'm actually going to drop a little thing and I asked Debbie for permission already. Um, if, if you are, especially if you're a researcher, but whoever, whatever your role, if you're interested in learning more about this network, uh, which will emerge, we believe uh, next month, um, we'll be populating and so on. This, again, this will be a, if you're doing anti-racist research, 
apply to tap into this network. And if it makes sense, um, we would love to connect you so you can have right folks to do your study. Um, but I bring it up right now because you know we have tried to answer these questions for ourselves in how we'll run this network. So I just want to mention a couple of criteria really quickly. There are five general criteria. I just want to mention a couple. One is, you know, what Laura Ann and uh, Gabby already said about the positionality of the research team. And that's not about, and again, you've already articulated this so well, it's not only about how people look, right, although that matters, but have you done your homework on the community? Are you familiar with Again, strengths, needs, and so on. What makes this particular community a particular community? Um, and this is not only about doing good research, right? In sort of some of the obvious ways we may think of, it's about signaling to the community that you respect them, right? Um, again, you've done the work, you've tried to recruit the, the sort of people who perhaps are from the community, or at least familiar with it, and so on. Um, yes, all the issues about community voice, which have already been well articulated. So. Yeah, it's soup to nuts, right? Ideally, you're not simply um, the only engagement with community isn't in the course of the study, right? Let's get your information to feed. No, yes, formulating the question, interpreting the results, all the sorts of things. And I'll just mention one last thing quickly, um, which is a part of one of our criteria, which is, you know, you know, what is the balance of sort of burdens and benefits to the community, not only to the participants, Right. Ideally, they're learning something. Ideally, they're being compensated. Um, you know, again, if, at least as a sign of respect for their time, but also for our community, right? If our embrace community, the folks who come through, who to whom we grant access to sort of our people, is there some way that your expertise, experience, and so on can we down to the benefit of our larger community? Maybe that means doing a webinar. Maybe me, who knows what it means, right? We'll figure it out. But again, these I think are not, um, these aren't things that you couldn't Google <laughs> and find suggestions around. The real question is, you know, do you have the courage of your conviction to actually enact them as opposed to simply professing to believe them? Thank you so much. So I have one last question and then before we go to the audience Q&A and I have not looked at the chat so I, I don't know what's in there but I'm, I will take a look. I, um, I want to ask you, this is a pretty, I think, challenging question because there may not just be one, but I want to ask you to identify one of the most, um, you know, what, you, what I would call like thorny issues right in the work that you do in the work and in what has come up for you or in your teams or in you know among your participants in doing the work that you do um and i will you know say whoever wants to go first please do um i know it's a little bit challenging to identify just one we've talked about a few things you know a few different issues and i think it would be um important i think to kind of talk through at least maybe one um that you know you would like to elevate in the conversation today before we go to the audience Q and A. Feel like I just used a lot of words, but um, I'll throw a few more into the mix and try to be more sparing. Um, so I'm going to do I'll do one and a half. Okay, um, I'll just refer to, and it's already been more than hinted at, but there really is kind of a pretty significant misalignment between what communities need and how researchers tend to do their work. Uh, and it is about this, the incentives, you know, that the academy offers researchers, right? So, yeah, we're going to do, right, we need to do three studies, they need to be published in peer-reviewed journals, it's going to take seven years. Um, and we're going to be really, 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 really careful about, you know, what advice we give because we really aren't quite sure there are a million caveats. And parents want to know, you know what, my kid is three <laughs> and my kid is growing right now. Um, what can you tell me? Because I'm at a loss, right? What is the best you can tell me? That's the half. The, the one that I want to highlight that shows up repeatedly for us is, right, there is, um, we, so much has been written about this and said about this. It really is true that we, broadly speaking, collectively tend to treat race relations as a binary, 
right? It's about white people and people who aren't white, right? White people and people of color. But really, it's multilateral, right? It's not a bilateral, it's a multilateral, right? It's, you know, and we know the complexities of racial labels and all of that. But broadly speaking, you know, they're white people and there are people identify as Latin A and Black or African American people and Asian American people, multiracial folks, Native Americans, and so on. And all of these groups, of course, have relationships internal to the group, but also across these groups. Um, I have spoken to you know any number of people, and in broadly describing what embrace race does, assume that it's only about white and non-white, right? Um, and that includes people of color, right? And I say, but you know, if you are raising a black identified child or children, are you also raising your child to think about yeah, how he, she, they perceive, relate to Latinx kids and Asian American kids and Native American, all of that? And are those families doing the same vis-a-vis -vis black children and each other? We know that 50% of public school children do not identify as white, right? White, non-Hispanic. And in many, many places, you know, black and brown kids are more likely to go together in school, go, go to school together, than either of them is with white children, for example. So, right, what's most salient in terms of race relations in many places are the intra-people of color interactions, but as, as sort of scarce as the resources are for this work in general, it's really scarce to do this work among communities of color. So that is, um, I think, a huge issue with huge implications for our politics and economy and all of that stuff. Um, and yeah, it is a getting more and more people to elevate that in importance within the space uh, is, is a real challenge. Thank you, Andrew. I'm just going to add quickly to that one because it was my same one um, and that I'm going to mention, but I, I will add to it, I think even within, right, like I study Latinx families and that's the complexities of what the myths around being mestizo, right, and like what does it mean to be a mixed race and that's a very strong narrative to then really think around anti-Blackness, anti-indigeneity, um, all these other components so that it's so much more complex and so I, it, it that complexity is really challenging to really, because it's not, it's around having these conversations broadly but also within your own group, like right, how much um, anti-indigeneity, we can just see what happened in LA as an example around some of those kinds of components in terms of the um, city council. So again, I think those are the pieces that I think are still, there's so much to do and so many conversations that need to be had. So it, and, and we have to start one talk at a time, as I would like to say, but, um, but we need to really think through in so many other ways. Thank you. Lauren, did you want to add? Yeah thorny issues that come up for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think uh, maybe perhaps the theme of this is, you know, Gabby's a comment on critical self-reflection, but I think that to be doing anti-racist work also does require a lot of ongoing critical self-reflection for me on my part, right? Opening also with my positionality as Korean American adoptee, I am on a personal level still ongoing doing a lot of work around that in order you know to do that critical self-reflection to support the professional work that i do um and that is really hard you know it's not you know it is a little thorny <laughs> um i think another thing that comes up for me also in terms of a thorny issue or it's something that's tricky is um you know i do i think about you know kind of bringing back to the sparks project conducting interviews our interview team had three people um, it was me and then also Victoria Veseldinos and Gabby Kuby, who are doctoral students um, at the University of Maine. Um, and we conducted 88 interviews together, the three of us. And something that did come up in that work is sometimes it is emotionally exhausting. Um, you know, and to be, you know, a a woman of color, I conducted interviews with Asian parents and Asian families, Asian American parents and families. You know, some of the questions that we ask included, um, you know, what does racism look like in your everyday life? Or what does racism look like in the lives of your children? And, you know, engaging in research in that way and hearing things that are familiar to me because they're a part of my own experience, that is hard. Um, and so knowing also when to 
pause or take a break. Gabby used the term earlier about like when to, when to the timing thing of when to wait and when to move with urgency. Also like adding in this component of when and how to care for yourself as you do it. Um, that is something that is ongoing for me that I'm still learning and working towards that I think is also part of the, you know, part of the work, part of the labor of, of anti-racist work. Thank you. Agreed on all counts. All of your points are really excellent. Thank you for sharing that. I know oh, there's a sorry. little bit of vulnerability when you're asking about thorny issues. Um, so I, I appreciate your sharing those with us. Um, and now, as promised, we're going to turn to the audience Q and A. We have a couple of questions, really great questions that have um, come here to me, and that I'm I think I'd like to um, ask you. One is for Laura Ann, um, and I think it's a really good one, and it's kind of its own thorny issue. You, in your um, introduction, you mentioned that you know love and support it was important, but it just wasn't enough. And I think that there's a kind of um, you know perspective out there among some families that it will carry the day. That you know if you just love your you know love children, if you love all children that you know this whole you know racism thing and this you know anti-immigrant sentiment like that's not really something you have to worry about and so i'm more wondering if you could elaborate and this is kind of a rephrasing of the question that we received but really elaborate a little bit more on like why isn't love enough in a sense wow these dogs are still barking Sorry. um thank <laughs> yes also thank you for the question um that is I really did not think someone would ask about that today. Um, and it is a, it's a question that I would respond to maybe more from a personal standpoint than from one that is academic. So please, Debbie, you can like shuffle me along if it's a little too much, but speaking also about like vulnerability, um, that may be where I try to respond to. Um, hmm. um, there's an ongoing sense of wanting to belong, of wanting to be affirmed for who we are, that if we situate what our normal is, our normal is with whiteness, with heterosexuality, with cisgender, like if that is what we think about as where our positioning of love comes from, that will create harm for children and individuals who do not identify in those ways. Um, and I'm sorry also to read in the comment I struggle myself with the fact that obviously our family at love and support did not support him from misfortune. I think, you know, children go out in the world, humans go out in the world and parents cannot control the world and what happens to their children. So much Laura Ann, uh, again, for your vulnerability. And, you know, I really, um, asked because I, it made me think of the color evasive narrative that really is the dominant narrative in a lot of um, families and the idea that you can love away, you know, racism or that it doesn't exist in our families. And I think, Andrew, I've heard you talk about this a little bit in terms of, you know, the desire, very strong desire to preserve um, racial innocence in children. I don't know if you want to add a little bit there. Um, I'll just, I'll just. Actually, I, you know, so yeah, Lauren, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, for being willing uh, to offer those particular insights. Um, in a way, what part of what's striking to me, and this is a, a little bit different thing, but you know, with appreciation certainly for the person who asked the question and um, what's happening, the dynamics of their family. But I think we know, right? I mean, we know that love, while wonderful and hopefully present in most families between parents and children, of course, it's not enough or it's not everything, right? It's be, you know, if it were, I mean, families, all families have dynamics, you know, and their challenges and, you know, the, the dynamics of uh, in a transracially adopted family Certainly, there may be patterns that, right, Laura Ann and your community, Laura Ann, of other transracially adopted kids or, you know, can speak to. I'm sure you could, without doubt, you could educate us a lot about those particularities, right? Some of the patterns, some of the differences you might see. But this basic point that 
um, love doesn't um, love doesn't say everything that needs to be said. Love doesn't sort of handle everything. Of course, is true, and we know that because you know if you have a family, grew up in a family, even even a chosen family uh, that is characterized by love is characterized by other things too. Um, so I think if we um you know if we take that to be well sure of course that's true uh, you know better to have love than not to have it by far but that's not everything uh, then perhaps you know we're free to yeah understand what else might be needed and what other kind of work might need to be done. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to another very interesting question. Um, and this family is asking, um, as same-sex white parents of a white young child, we welcome best practices and approaches to advocate for anti-racist, multiracial, and DEI-centered curriculum in our child's school, right? Particularly given, right, all of this, um, you know, what we know is a hostile climate in many places to um, CRT or anything that's explicitly racial being um, broached or addressed or taught in um, elementary schools around the country. And I was wondering if, if any of you have thoughts about that and how to help parents, you know, um, sort of advocate for, for racial learning in schools um, in, these, in this climate. Gabby, it looks like you're gonna. <laughs> I was like, oh, I just looks like you're gonna jump in. I, well, I, I guess one thing that I feel like is that people should use the voice that they have, right? And so, like, I think a lot of times, sometimes we stay out of the fray of some of these contentious kinds of of, of pieces. I mean, people were just. I was watching the news last night, showing school board meetings that just have gotten <laughs> like way out of control, right? And so people are like, you know what, this isn't, I'm not gonna get in because that there's, so I, I guess the place is to be brave, right? How can you be brave? How can you do, how can, you may not have to show up at the school board, but maybe you collect petitions. Maybe you go and you'd have these conversations and have conversations with other parents, have conversations with people who might be, who might not know what critical race theory is or what it even means, um, be informed, get that information and have, conversations in that community. I really harken back to what um, Andrew was saying earlier that we are building this community together, right? And so that means that we need to have those conversations, not just with people who agree with us, but for people who disagree with us in a way that meets them, not in like a, you don't know anything, what are you talking about? But hey, tell me your worries. What are your concerns? What are you worried that your kid will learn and help them see that that might not be, you know, that the things that they're worried about may not be what what will happen. I think a lot of times, one thing that was really helpful for me was to learn how to have dialogue as opposed to argument. And I think we often approach these conversations as I'm right, you're wrong. Um, and you know, and as, if we really approach the, I wanna hear your worries, I wanna hear your concerns, and I, and I wanna really understand that. And I wanna share my perspective with you. Maybe you'll see it my way, maybe you don't, but to really have a dialogue, I think is a way that, that families can, can do that. And that starts at the bus stop. That starts at the PTA meeting. That starts when you're in your kid's school. Um, um, so anyway, that would be the, the the thought I have around that is that we need to have these brave conversations all the time. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. Let me let me pick up actually on the, you know, I think certainly one thing, and I here I'm just echoing Gabby, yeah, find your people, find your people, right? It's a good bet that there are other people in that community, certainly among parents, but among teachers, administrators, other staff in the community who share your concerns, right? Who um, share your impulses, your 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 wants. Uh, and, you know, one way to do that, and this is where, again, being brave, as Gabby said, it becomes important. Sometimes you need to make yourself visible to them, right? So yeah, I think if you go to that school board meeting, if you're willing to go and make a statement where you declare yourself, Right, then there's a better chance that you become visible to others who might now be encouraged to approach you and say, okay, and I know someone over here, right? We were speaking to my neighbor, my you know, kid's best friend's you know, parent, whatever it is. So find your people, I think, is, is really important. Another thing is, I think, um, you know, uh, 
don't be, you know, don't fall into the trap, I would say, of declaring what you're against, right? Talk about what you're for. You know, the CRT thing is is nonsense, right? Um, so I wouldn't so much say, you know, CRT is being taught in the schools. It's, it's like, well, what is it that you want positively? Let's try to name that um, and go for that, right, as well as we can. And then related to that, how do you get there? You know, I think one good place to start might be in a way where with the school's own declarations, right? So a lot of school have, schools have a mission, right? This is what we're about. It's a really good bet that to enact their mission, to realize their mission in a meaningful way means doing the work that you're describing, right? What you're talking about, DEI, anti-racist, multi -race. Connect it to that, right? Make that case and hopefully you and your people can make that case. Like, how are we gonna get there if we don't take at least some steps down this road that I'm describing? Um, and, you know, have, yeah, have the, the committee, school committee members or the, you know, the, the principal or whoever sort of uh, try to make the counter case if they can. But I suspect, you know, again, they, there's so much sort of um, demonizing of the perspective, right? CRT is just a way, of course, of, so let's not do that because that's actually, I think, a hard game to, to win. But yeah, the positive, affirmative, and it really is true, by the way, that a lot of people um, who say yes, for example, yes, I'm really, you know, distraught by the idea of CRT, as we know, not only don't know what CRT is, but if they actually heard the affirmative vision, would say, that actually sounds pretty cool. That's not so bad. I'd like my kid to learn more about, et cetera. Yeah. So it's hard to believe, but we are uh, nearing the close of our time together. Um, this has been really wonderful. I want to invite each of you to to maybe share one closing thought with our audience. Um, and I will ask Laura Ann to start. A closing thought. Um, you know, I'm really grateful to be to be here. Also, um, you know, just thinking also about the, you know, who is on this panel and conversation today. Um, you know, Gabby brings scholarly expertise, and you know, Andrew is, is on our community advisory board. So thinking about what a collective and a collaboration of different experiences look like. You know, from our conversation today, I've learned a lot. Also, from your um, experiences and expertise, and I think that this um, this conversation is very much you know, an example of, of what, um, what are the kinds of community impact that we're talking about with this Research Media Impact Fellows group. I think that this is a, you know, example of that. So also just really want to want to thank everybody today. And also to thank those of you who asked questions in the chat. Thank you. Uh, Gabby? Well, I want to thank you all for joining. I've also been grateful to share this space with everyone, and I've learned a lot as well. And I, I think the one piece I will leave is that sometimes it's hard to, I'm going to go back to that possible list. Sometimes it's hard because it feels like it's so much to change. There's so many things to do. But if we all took one step, right, just think about what is one thing you can do and lean into that action um, and do it. And something that maybe you've been a little bit scared to do or a little bit worried to have, whether a conversation with someone or a new thing you're going to learn about, but just lean into that. Because I think that's, it's once you start walking it, you realize that even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's hard, the benefits uh, outweigh that. Um, that that discomfort. Thank you, Andrew. That's awesome, Gabby. You have returned the favor. Earlier, you said that I've made the point you're going to make. Now you've made the point I'm going to make. I was going to make. Um, so we're even. You know, I think. Um, yeah, it really. I think we we. I guess I would encourage all of us to take seriously the idea that we can make a difference that the future, you know, certainly there is path dependency, right? There are certain futures that we can't realize in 10 years because of things that have happened already. But there is a very meaningful range of possible futures that we will, you know, hopefully live to see in five years and 10 years and whatever number of years. And that range, the difference between being here and being here is meaningful. 
And which one of those gets realized will depend in part on us, you know, uh, the, the four of us right here and, you know, the, the many of you who are watching and listening and all the folks who are, who are in neither space, right? So, so yeah, so echoing Gabby, what can we learn? How can we do better? But the learning is not enough and the how, you know, feeling bad about something is not enough. What is our practice? How do we make our convictions manifest in the world? Yeah, let's take that challenge seriously. And um, and, and to the extent that more of us do it, uh, who certainly would, you know, more of those of us who agree with, you know, are aligned with what's been said here today, we will absolutely realize a, a more rather than less promising future for ourselves and our kids. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Keenan to take us home here. I appreciate all of you so much and the audience. Wow, this has been awesome. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you to Gabby, Andrew, Laura Ann, and Debbie for moderating. Uh, the content, your contact information will be posted in the chat. Please complete the post event survey at the end of this discussion and continue the conversations online with the hashtag uh, Hashtag NCID anti racism and follow us on Twitter at UMISH NCID. Thank you to the NCID event production team and to you for joining this conversation today. Please help us by completing that survey. All right. Thank you very much. We encourage you to continue this conversation. Until then. <laughs>